So Tajay Bogatia, he can do everything right. He's the 23-year-old who can win them all. The Grand Tours, the short stage races, one-day races, cobbled classics. Well, it certainly looked that way until a possible win in the coveted Ronde, the Tour of Flanders, somehow slipped through his fingers in a nail-biting finish to the Belgian classic. A little bit on the way, but Douas and Van Baalen are there. This is the moment for Mathieu van der Poel to go for himself, from top off. But Douas is ice strong, Van der Poel has to see him on the way. But Douas is an ass, but Van der Poel is sitting there for him. He takes him down, Dylan van Baalen is going to the podium. Pogacar not, Pogacar is Van der Poel wins for the second time. The round of Vlaanderen, two Dylan van Baalen, three Mar Douas, four Pogacar. Well, hello to you. My name's OJ Borge and welcome to the latest Aerogram podcast for Peloton magazine, recorded in the afterglow, it quite literally is an afterglow, of a breakneck 2022 ronde in which Matthew van der Poel battled to victory and Pogaccia proved he was human after all, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, I'm joined by the Monuments men. They are Jeremy Whittle, cycling correspondent to The Guardian. Hello, Jezza. Hello there. Uh, and also by Peter Costins, multi-award winning author who's written a whole book about the monuments, of which, of course, Flanders is one. So, Pete, as chair of the committee, as the living god king of all monuments, where does this one sit in the pantheon of the Ronde? I think it was a it was a very good Ronde. I think it, I really I really enjoyed it. Wasn't wasn't the best, uh, but the last 60k were, were were kind of unmissable. There was stuff going on all the time, right from the time they kind of came into the Oude Quaremont the key climb the, the second time, second of three times they went up it. And Tade Pogacar just went completely nuts on the climb. And from that moment on, you you couldn't take your eyes off the race right until the very last 20 metres. Mm. It was one of those, wasn't it, where you obviously knew what Pogacar's plan was, and that was to break Matthew van der Poel, who is, you know, obviously one of the most talented riders we've ever seen, but he's not as good on the climbs as Pogacar is. And Jeremy, he was very close to cracking Van der Poel. I think Van der Poel said afterwards that he's never known that much lactate in his legs. I thought it was great on the Paterberg because there was a moment where it looked like Pogacar was just going to leave him behind. And he dug, you could see that he was kind of bounce. He had to go over to the right-hand side of the cobbles and gather gather himself. I mean, it took, you know, a nanosecond and then go again to try and close the gap to Pogacar. And that was, I think that was actually when he, when he won the race because that was the moment where Everything was in everything was in play. Obviously, the sprint as well, but that that to me was almost the biggest moment where you saw the making of the man. I think in terms of uh, you know a Ron a Ron winner, and also I think the other thing it demonstrated was that winning Flanders is not just about how well you climb the Bergs; it's about how tactically astute you are, and also how many times have we seen people come into those last what 10, 15 kilometers and get it wrong. I mean, it, we've seen it quite a lot, and it, quite often the strong, the guy that you think is the strong man, is confounded. And everyone thought Pogacar were probably. I think they were fairly well matched, but people thought that Pogacar's just his exuberance would get the better of it. But he 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 got it so wrong. He did. I mean, the thing is, though, do you think maybe with Pogacar? I mean, he's been so amazing over the past couple of years. You know, since he won that first Tour de France, he has been all imposing on the peloton. Do you think maybe the fact he's been so good has hidden Peter, some of his technical immaturity. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, I think there's a... It's, I mean, it's, it's still almost too early to say, but I think there's an interesting thing going on with Pogacar. He seems to... I mean, he learns very quickly from his mistakes. And, I mean, we saw he he, he was caught out in Dois de Vlanderen on on, uh, on Wednesday, which, which van der Poel won. He finished up 10th there. He was kind of badly positioned at a key point in the race, tried to chase across and, and never made it. And he seemed to kind of learn from that. He was really well positioned today. But I think there was kind of, a, there was an, you kind of have to look at the flip side of it as well. Last year, I think, you think back to, to last year's uh, Tour of Flanders when Van der Poel came into the finish with uh, Kaspar Asgreen. And I'm pretty sure that Van der Poel thought back to that and thought, I was beaten in the sprint that day. I did too much on the climbs and it took something out of my legs. And I just think, Basically, he rode up the... I mean, he obviously struggled. He said it was hard following Pogacar. But apart from one, I think on one climb, when he committed pretty strongly, he was prepared, he was quite happy sitting in behind and saving himself for the sprint. And I think that was crucial. I think Pogacar got his tactics wrong at the end, but I think van der Poel, he learned a lesson from last year and put that to good use. 
Well, well, obviously. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, when you look to them, and it's worth if you've not seen the, the stage race, just to talk about what happened at the end, because they were away. Van der Poel and Pogaccia, they were away. It was the two of them. It was a two-up sprint. How Pogaccia managed to, and I think, what was the line you saw, Peter? I think it's a great line, isn't it? That he's the first man ever to come fourth in a two-man sprint. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because they were, they were coming up to the line, and uh, the, the two of them together, and it was almost like a, a track sprint. Yeah. Van der Poel was on the front. Pogacar was, was kind of waiting and waiting and waiting. They're both looking back. And you had uh, Van Bala and, uh, and um, Valentin Madwell, a young French kid, coming up behind them. And it actually ended up being a, a four-rider sprint in which Pogacar got completely boxed in. Van der Poel was at the front and just kind of fled away from the other three. And Pogacar ended up fourth out of uh, when, he, when he should have been at least second. <laughs> Jeremy? Yeah, but it was, it was interesting, wasn't it? Because... He was really frustrated and he kind of like pushed. He kind of did a bit of elving with Dylan Van Baal, didn't he? As, he, as he went past him in the sprint, kind of just, just pushed him a little bit as if to suggest that he was out, that he was in his line. And then as the, the sprint played out and Van Der Poel won, he was kind of, you know, had his arms up in dismay and then kind of was, you know, banging the handlebars off and then rode off off the finish and was exasperated and was kind of had to be calmed down by Mauro Ginetti, who's the team manager. Um, and it's and it's kind of like it just was your own fault, you know. I mean, he suddenly seemed like a, uh, not a kid, not a kid, not childlike, but very young. You know, it was it was one of those few occasions where everybody says, "Oh, he's so incredibly mature. He's got great maturity as a bike rider, great maturity when he deals with the media, all of that," which is really true. But he suddenly looked his age um, after that and um, slightly threw his toys out of his pram. I think. Mm. I think that there was. Um... I, I read somewhere that the his UAE team manager, Zan Pogacar, went to the race jury afterwards to complain about the sprint. And it was interesting because uh, I also read some quotes from uh, from the Group Arma team, the, the, from from uh, Valentin Madwas. And uh, he said that when he actually got out of the saddle to sprint, he immediately seized up with cramp. And so he, he just had to sit sit back down again. And so obviously he tried to sprint, couldn't sat down and Pogachar came right up behind him and had nowhere to go. So I mean, effectively, Madua getting cramped stopped stopped Pogachar going through. I and mean, it wasn't anything; it wasn't anybody's fault. Nobody tried to squeeze him out deliberately. It's just one of those things that happens at, at the end of a race of two hundred and seventy-five kilometers. Pogaccia should not have been in that situation. Let's let's put it like that. They were away. They never should have been in that situation. He's a talented rider. He's a Grand Tour rider. You know, we've seen him ride away from entire pelotons before. Jeremy, he shouldn't have been in that situation. I mean, that's that's the that's the long and short of it. I mean, this after after the race is over, I started. There was something. There was a tweet, I think, by somebody about kind of like you know what what's what's what other circumstances can you remember when a, like a two up sprint has been caught by a rider who's been accelerating through from behind. And there's loads of examples of it as well. And I mean, more more obvious ones, I suppose, where there's been two riders foxing and then somebody else comes hurtling past off a descent and, you know, goes past the moment and wins. Um, but that wasn't, it wasn't that really. It was more like they just kind of misjudged. I think they misjudged the speed they needed to go. I mean, Van der Poel didn't, did he? Because he got it right. Uh, but another 10 metres and it might have been a different story. He seemed in control of it at all times. And Van der Poel seemed in control. When he was doing the whole... What we mean by track sprint is literally he was riding forwards while looking over his left shoulder the entire time, keeping him in view. He looked like a great track sprinter. Yeah, I think he I think he learned the harsh lessons of last year. And um, he's more accomplished in that in those situations than Pogacar is as well. Uh, but... Yeah. You know, it's, it was interesting. it's interesting to see that he's not perfect, isn't it? Because everybody's since the start of the season, been going about, oh, you know, he's going to win everything. And it's kind of like, and I think it is slightly boring when somebody wins everything, you know, when, when you almost know he's going to win the race a race before the start. And he will, presumably because he is so gifted and talented, he, he will have learned a huge amount from that. Do you think it's good for cycling that Pogaccia is losing? Yes. I think it's, I think it adds a, I think it adds a nice, a nice edge to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's I th- I mean, look, looking back, it, the, the first first when the when the two of them were away, the the thing that struck me, and I think it struck a lot of other people also, was the fact that unfortunately Woot Van Aert couldn't couldn't start the race. So you kind of had the potential there for all three of these guys who who were real phenomenons to to be there together. But um, I mean, Pogacar just looks in control all of the time. 
so in control that you, you wonder where his um, where his rivals are going to get a, get a look in somehow. And it, and we've we've seen we've seen moments where there have been moments of weakness. I remember in the tour stage uh, last year, stage seven, the longest stage of the race uh, through the Morvan in on the uh, northern edge of the Massif Central. He got he got caught out then, and uh, he got kind of beaten up a bit by all his rivals, and was really angry at the finish. And then the next day, he went, went and put matters right on in the, on the stage of Le Grand Bonon, just gave him all a good kicking. And I just wonder whether he's going to come back. I don't know what the next race on his schedule is, but when he when he's going to come back and, and kind of deal out the same treatment again and just kind of uh, just put everything right. So what you're saying is, I mean, a podcast, this is a podcast, and uh, everyone loves a sweeping statement and a generalisation and maybe some hyperbole in a podcast, is what you're saying then, what I'm hearing here, is that Pogac has been found out and that's it for him. At the age of 23, he's done for, the Peloton's got the handle on him. <laughs> that's what you're saying. I got it. I heard you. No. No, I, th- I think it was just interesting. I thought the reaction was actually more interesting than the result because he reacted in quite... Not a petulant way, but I think, you know, accusing Van Baal of and Madwasil. How is that not petulant? Go on, tell me how that's not petulant. Well, it is, but it is petulant, yeah. And I think it, his immaturity showed. And as I said earlier, we've credited him with so much maturity and gone on about how well he handles the media and stuff. But you can see he was, you know, the reality of how old he was, mm. you know, which is like still very, very young. So uh, still some way to go. And um, I think it also showed that maybe he can be... Uh, irked or discombobulated or not not you know mentally he may not be as strong as people always assume so that un- under the right circumstances maybe he is a bit more fragile than people think but I mean you know look at his physical talents it's all relevant did you think then because we've seen it a couple of times that if you can stay with him you can probably outfox him is that is that what you need to be able to do if you can stay with Pogaccia then that's when the weakness comes in. The issue has been, in pretty much every race we've seen him in, no one can live with him. I think what was crucial today, I mean, there's there a lot of talk about experience and could he could he win the Tour of Flanders on his debut and nobody had done that since René Martins 40 years ago. I mean, it would have been a, a phenomenal achievement. But what ultimately worked against him was the fact that he, he didn't have the experience at the end. And Van der Poel had it. Van der Poel is now in his in the last three editions of Flanders. He's finished first, second, and first. And when he finished second, he was obviously out sprinted by by Asgreen. So he was very close to to winning then. And it just he just made that experience tell. I think he he basically let Pogacar get on with it. I mean, all right, he, he said at the end, uh, "I've never had my legs have never been so full of lactate, and it it was awful trying to follow him." But I think. At, he was just he all the way in from the top of the Paterberg. Van der Poel was waiting for for a sprint, and I just had the feeling that like Pogacar almost played into his hands by by not trying to attack at least once or twice, trying to trying to tire him out. He just I wouldn't say he laid it, he laid the victory at, at Van der Poel's feet, but uh, kind of didn't make it hard enough for him on the on the run in. No. Well, I'll tell you, well, let's hear what Bogaccia had to say after the finish. It was uh, all in all a great experience. It was uh, really an, an amazing race. And uh, the team was super, uh, it was perfect. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we lighted up in the end with uh, Matthew, we went uh, alone. And uh, yeah, it was uh, the atmosphere on the, on the climb, it was, uh, yeah, uh, it was incredible. You seemed very disappointed when you crossed the line. Oh yeah, it, uh, in the moment I was really disappointed because I couldn't do my uh, my sprint. I was boxed in, but yeah, that cycling sometimes uh, you're boxed in, sometimes you you have uh, open road. But yeah, I was just uh, I was not even uh, really mad about uh, to anyone. Uh, it seemed maybe like this, but uh, I was frustrated with, with myself and uh, uh, because I couldn't do the the best uh, 100 meters to the finish. Tadej Pogaccia there, who seemed pretty unhappy that Dylan Van Baal of Ineos went past him to take second place in the sprint. Here is Van Baal himself. Yeah, I wasn't expecting any more to sprint for the victory, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I was, I was confident in the sprint after, uh, after doing 70, 70k. I'm, I'm not that... Um, I, I'm, I'm not super quick, but 
at least I don't uh, lose so much power. Um, so I was confident to uh, sprint for the third place, but then all of a sudden we, we were sprinting for the victory and yeah, it went so fast, everything, so uh, you needed to decide really quick. Um, but at the end, Mathieu was too, too quick. Spring riding, it is back, and Hammerhead's Carew 2 is the only bike computer with predictive path technology to help you get more out of your rides. And I know this because I have one, and it's wonderful. Explore with confidence with the most advanced GPS navigation and routing available, and its exclusive climber feature to see upcoming gradient changes in real time. And if it's a big change, you can weep onto its waterproof skin. Get your Carew 2 today at hammerhead.io. Use promo code AEROGRAM, that's AERO, A-E-R-O, gram with two M's and an E, to get a free custom colour kit and exclusive premium water bottle when you purchase a Carew 2. That's hammerhead.io, promo code AEROGRAM. Or if I was going to say it as it's written, AEROGRAME. Peter, you, you've written books about this. Where does the Ron, the tour of... Uh, the Tour of Flanders, where does it sit in the lexicon of all the great monuments? What, if, in, among the five? Mm. Every, every time we go to a monument, I always say this is the best one. So I'm going to say that again today, that, that Flanders is the best one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought San Remo was the best one two weeks ago. The five are San, Milan San Remo, Tour of Flanders, Paris Bay, Liège, Bastogne, Tour of Lombardy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... If I was really honest, I, Flanders is always my favourite because I think it's uh, there's something very unique about the Tour of Flanders for for the people of Flanders. It, it's a, a race that, when it was established in in the in 1913, they, it was first run. It kind of gave people who who spoke Dutch or, or Flemish in in uh, Dutch speaking part of, of Belgium, a, a sense of identity. Like the country was essentially a French speaking country then. And it was set up by this um, Flemish speaking newspaper. And it, it, it kind of enabled uh, the Flemish people to have, have pride in, a, in an event, a, a, a big event. And it's always, it's always meant a huge amount to them since then. I mean, I think I, I saw stats today. I mean, obviously the last couple of years there's been new fans at the side of the road. But I saw uh, somebody say there were a million people at the, at the roadside. Ooh. And I think I think Flanders, the population of Flanders is six million. So you think that's like one in every six people in Flanders is out watching that race today. I mean, that's just astonishing. Yeah, that's the, the beauty of city centre races. Well, city centre races that are in an urban conurbation. I do like it when there is a people are going up different climbs. I do like it when they're going up the same climb because it just means they can film it better. Jeremy, talk, talking of, of fans, who was the guy running up the climb with a flag? Who was he? I'm not interested in him. I'm interested in the guy who ran onto the finish line. Oh, okay. The, cli the climate justice now man who nearly got a top ten finish. <laughs> did he? Did he get out sprinted as well? Yeah, he did. He did. He messed it up too. Maybe bigger Pogacar's dad. I don't know. But anyway, he, he, yeah, he 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 it was bizarre because he ran. He ran. Came over the barriers just as they were sprinting and started alongside them. Obviously, they went. He was on one side of the road, and then he kind of jogged on a bit further. Then he kind of had his coat over his arm, and he kind of stopped. Vehicle, a vehicle, which I think was a race, a race official car, kind of went around him, and then he just kind of got to the finish line and st stood around a bit, and then leant against the barriers, and then a whole bunch of kind of like security goons rushed down and kind of manhandled, manhandled him out of the way. I mean, normally my experience of the police on the finish line of the Tour of Flanders is that you know they don't take any prisoners, and uh, I'm I'm sure he's he's in A and E somewhere or in a ditch somewhere after that moment. So the guy, I mean, the one I'm talking about here is the fan. He'd obviously leaped the barriers. I'm pretty sure he's very close to the start of the race. He was definitely in, in the front at the pointy end. And he had a, a lion of Flanders flag on him. And he was running along. He got the flag caught under the car, although it didn't pull it under. But I didn't see him be really chastised by the crowd around him. And he was very much in the way on one of the climbs. No, I, th I, th I noticed that as well. And he was, you're right, he was, nearly, he was running up after a group, wasn't he? And then there was another group approaching. And then the car ran over his flag. But... I, there's always incidents like this on that race. And I remember, you know, there was the infamous incident where Peter Sagan got his, his handlebars caught in a coat. Uh, somebody had leant over the, I, I think that was the top of the Quermont, I think. And somebody put their kind of, their their down jacket. Well, I don't know which brand it was, but it was a down jacket. They put it over the, um, over the barriers and he was hugging the barriers, trying to get away from another rider. And he caught his handlebars and they both went down. And then there was infamous incident with Jesper Skibby, the Danish rider, who got, I think I was on the Koppenberg, wasn't it? And he was, he came down. It was so slow. He lost his balance and wobbled and fell, I think. 
and the team car had nowhere to go. The, the, not the team car, the race director's car was right behind him and there was a group right behind the car. So they just had to carry on. So they just basically drove over Jesper Skibby as he lay there moaning. And they kind of clipped his foot and his front wheel. And it's one of those really famous pictures that I think Graham Watson, the legendary cycling photographer, took years and years ago. And you can see this moment of Skibby kind of screaming and the car just going over his his wheels and his feet and the toe clips. They're just kind of about missing. I mean, they drove over his soul, I think, without managing to kind of <laughs> crush his foot. But so it's one of those races where, I mean, I, I've been a few times and it's, I kind of like got a bit freaked out because it was so manic. There were, mo- you know, where, where people like go and watch them on one berg and they run across country on a motorbike or a track bike or a quad bike or something, crazily going through the fields and the tracks to get to the next berg. So they can see them go up the next climb, and it's just you know if you, it's crazy, you can't really work on it because as a journalist, because it's just so manic. It is. It's one of those races I've never been to. I'd love to go to at some point. My only experience of bike racing in Belgium is I went to the World Championships, and I must admit, um, which was held in Belgium last year, and it is crazy to see how passionate the Belgian fans are. How, how passionate or how intoxicated they are. Well. The, but this is the point, isn't it? And I don't think Belgium's good. I don't think Belgium's a good place for you. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not convinced Belgium's a place for you though, because you know, high alcoholic intake. Judging judging from your your recovery from last night's last night's pizza party. So tell me, Ben, about the Belgian cycling fans, because you know we see every now and again they get they get very drunk, they get very excitable. I have been to the World Championships. That's the only experience I have of bike racing in Belgium was the World Champs last year, which was brilliant. But there was so much Stella spilt onto the streets that it was a little sticky underfoot, like being in a bar, just being on the pavement. Cycling is like football in Belgium, I think. Uh, you know, it inspires that kind of frenzy and that kind of loyalty. And it's very partisan as well. And I think because it's such a small country and, I mean, okay, they've got a great football team, football team that was number one in the world until very recently. But cycling is definitely a religion there. And, you know, they've got this uh, very kind of archaic regional culture in Belgium as well. Um that kind of split splits them on language terms, on on linguistic terms, and on political terms as well. So, I think Flan- Flanders is about identity as much as it is about bike racing. It's one of those one of those races where it speaks to a certain contingency of Flanders and a certain kind of identity, which I think is probably quite a traditional identity. And that's that's where it really really scores with people. And then. You layer on top of that, you layer the kind of international appeal of the race and the fact that it has such prestige. And because most bike riders probably regard it as the hardest of the one-day races, I think maybe Liège is a harder race in some ways. But I don't think there's anything quite as brutal as Flanders. No, not with those amazing climbs. I mean, you look at the profiles when they pop up on the TV coverage, and it's twenty percent. You know, some of the climbs is that. I think it's the um, the final climb, isn't it, Peter? That that gets up to twenty percent. And you think the, the Paderberg, yeah, the Paderberg, yeah. You mean they're going up that at speed over cobbles. I mean, it was it was dry today. When it's wet, what is it like when it's wet? I mean, they're slipping all over the place, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I actually I rode the Tour of Flanders Sportif. I can't remember what year it was. Maybe. 2014 or 15 and uh, it was it was absolutely freezing the day that it was a day before the pros did the race we had freezing weather it was rain um i walked up the koppenberg because everybody else was walking it was just like wall-to-wall riders uh, but i managed to ride okay up the udaquaramont and and the paterberg but that the, the, the problem i mean you've, you've got to stay in the saddle i mean you saw them today they were staying in the saddle but as soon as it gets wet if you try and stand on the pedals at all, you're finished because you've got no traction at all. So, I mean, it is a race for hugely powerful riders, which is why Van der Poel's finished first, second and first the last mm. the last three years. And he'll probably be the man to beat next year. So Matthew Van der Poel does take his second run. Let's switch our attention now to the women's race, which had another tense finish, but one that followed the current form book with Belgian national champion Lottie Kopecky out sprinting Annemiek van Vluten after the double Dutch winner had seen her last ditch attacks thwarted on the Paterberg. And it was a great race, wasn't it, Jeremy? Yeah, well, it was. I think it was one of those races where you kind of... the 
finale was all on whether Annemiek van Vluten could break the stranglehold of Team SD Works, and she she puffed and puffed, but wasn't able to do it. And her last chance didn't work out on the final climb, so she had to ride in with them to the sprint. And you knew that there was only going to be one winner, but nonetheless, it was still excellent prints by by Lotte Kapeki. And um, you know, she she's won Strada Bianchi already this year. She's kind of they they did a good job because they got rid of some of the other contenders like Marianne Voss and Elisa Balsamo and ensured that Kopecky could show who wearing the Belgian national champions jersey, of course, which is just you know so memorable for her. So um, I didn't think it was it wasn't as thrilling or as unexpected as the men's race, but I, I think the 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 fact that those riders and their career paths and their career histories are now becoming as much ingrained into the psyche of, psyche of cycling as the men's palmares and their career histories is is really is really encouraging and it's all building up really nicely towards the women's tour de france which of course will be the pinnacle of the women's season this this year i thought i thought the interesting thing about the women's race was i mean we saw with the men it was like essentially uh Mano a mano. It was, there was there was no kind of team. No nobody had a teammate there. It was just one guy, one guy against another, and the women's race was completely different to that. We had uh, SD Works. I mean, if they really, I mean, all the way. They they just they they made they moved when when they needed to in order to get rid of their rivals, like Jeremy said, and then coming into the finish, they had at one point there were six riders clear. They had three riders in that break. And you just thought there's there's no way they're gonna they're gonna lose this. Van Vluten, or all right, she she might have won it in the past, but she wasn't gonna she wasn't gonna be able to. I mean, they they were just attacking her in turn, and they it was just a brilliant piece of team riding, basically. And is that is that normal for the Tour of Flanders? Is it normal normally that the the strongest team wins? I think that's quite unusual for for uh, for for a team to be as strong as that to have to have as many riders in the finale as that, but. Uh, I mean, I think we saw in the men's race that UAE were one of the strongest teams. They, they, I mean, obviously they're riding for Pogacar, and he he was up there at the end. I mean, the teams that we expected to be strong weren't strong at all. I mean, Quick Step were, I, th- I think it was their worst finish ever in in Flanders. I think they're, they're well, he dropped his chain, didn't he, Casper Asgren? He he dropped his chain on one of the birds. Yeah, and I th- I, can't, I can't remember who their their first. I think um, I can't remember who their first finisher was, but I think it was in twenty seventh place. And obviously, Jumbo Visma, they didn't have Van Aert, uh, Christophe Laporte. What happened to Van Aert? What happened to Van Aert? COVID. COVID. Oh, is it COVID? Yeah. Wow. And okay. uh, Christophe Laporte ended up in a ditch at one point, had to be fished out of a ditch. And that kind of, he then had to chase for, for a long way after that. We saw Tish Benut trying to uh, trying to get across at one or two points. But, I mean, those, those, are the, those are the teams that we were expecting to be strong and they weren't. I mean, this spring has been not a disaster for Quick Step, but it's not been good, has it, compared to previous springs? And we've always had very high expectations from them, the classics. So they will be really disappointed by what's. It's it's hard it's hard to pick out a stellar performance. I'm trying to think of who has performed in a really um, high profile race at the very top of their game. Alaf Alaf Philippe's been very subdued, hasn't he? Because of illness. I mean, he started off okay, was quite strong in. The Tour de la Provence that you were at, Pete, but he's kind of this month or last month into this month, he's uh, he's really struggled, and obviously illness is continuing. Illness has dogged him, hasn't it? Was that the Ineos have had issues as well, haven't they? Um, just just to go back to the women's race, um, Jeremy mentioned the fact that it's all building up to the women's Tour de France, which we're very excited about happening this summer. What does what does women's cycling have to do to keep this excitement? Because we've had some great races. Strada Bianchi's been brilliant. Ronde was a success. What do they need to do just to keep this excitement ahead of the Tour de France? I'd say that they need to ensure that they can keep everybody fit and healthy because one of the problems they're having, as we as we were discussing, I think, in an earlier pod, was the number of races that there now are, the number of riders they require to have enough riders to put to these various races as well, and the fact that the calendar's kind of almost outstripping the abilities or the or the resources of the teams. For women's cycling this year is be all and end all. And whilst these are the races... It, of the races getting the profile they finally deserve there is no showcase you know like 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 the Tour de France I mean that's evidenced by Netflix moving in on the Tour de France this year to shoot their documentary series 
with, with 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 the thing they're shooting at the Tour de France, the drive to survive for cycling. Um, there was always a bit of a meme that was going round years ago when people were talking about new TV formats. So they always go, "We want to do the Top Gear for cycling, the Top Gear for Dominoes, the Top Gear for whatever whatever it was they'd want to do the Top Gear, which was you know about friends." Um, doing whatever it was with with cars being the background to Top Gear. It now seems like Drive to Survive is what everybody wants to do for their sports. Do you think it's going to be a success for cycling, seeing behind the scenes with a certain number of teams? Do you think it will bring in a whole new range of fans, Peter, as it has done for F1? Because Formula One now is full of people who who didn't know what Formula One was or didn't watch it two years ago. It, it's, it's funny because I, I, I watch uh, Drive to Survive, the F, F1 version, and really, really enjoyed it. I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it and how uh, it kind of showed me the personalities and what was going on behind the scenes. And you kind of got a better idea of, of what was going on in races. But I, I actually don't watch any of the F1 <laughs> races at all. I mean, it, it's kind of, the, 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 the program's fascinating, but I still, I'm still not gripped by the sport. I mean, uh, I, I guess it's, perhaps I'm unusual in that because it obviously has brought new people to the sport. But I, I imagine that when they do a cycling version, it, it's going to show that that side of of racing that is really difficult if you're not a fan to to grasp the, the kind of the tactics of it, what's going on behind the scenes in terms of preparation and whatever. And I think that's really vital because uh, I mean one one of the things I mean if we if we look at Flanders today, I listened to uh, to the GCN commentary of it with uh, they had Dan Lloyd on there and uh, and Robbie McEwen. Those two guys know that race so well, and particularly McEwen, who who his wife is is Flemish and uh, lived in 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 Belgium for for years and years, and the insight he was giving was kind of was was really riveting. And for me, who who, who knows the sport extremely well, even even I was I was learning loads of stuff, and I just thought this this is what we need. This is kind of we need more of this stuff to tell us about what's going on, where the race is. What, it, when they turn right at this junction up here, where it's going to go next and what that's going to mean and why they're all moving up in these positions. And that's what McEwen was given. And maybe Drive to Survival or Ride to Survival will do that as well to a certain extent. It will give people a better idea of what's going on in cycling because a lot of the time, um, and I, I talked to my dad who's who's really got into cycling in a big way, and he'll he'll say to me, I've really got no clue what's going on most of the time. It just They're just riding along in a big bunch and I'd like to know more. So here's a question for you. Here's a question for you both. You have to choose one name. Uh, Ride to Survive. Well, is that that's not what it's called, is it? Are we just calling it that? We're just calling it. That, I think. Yeah. Okay, right. So Ride to Survive is going to follow one cyclist, so we get to see their personality. Which cyclist would have the best personality for a TV audience? It doesn't have to be the, the most positive personality or a personality that's going to grip a TV audience that knows nothing about cycling. It's probably an Australian or an American, but I think probably for a British audience, Geraint Thomas is dry laconic uh appearance and his humor and everything like that would, would go down quite well but he, people know him quite well already for an american audience he would be too nice so it'd have to be somebody like maybe mark cavendish i'm going to throw mark cavendish out there because mark cavendish you know he's joint on the amount of stages won at the tour de france he has won pretty much everything he redefined sprinting a lot of ways been top of his game for a long time but he is somebody who is prone to being very high energy and very, very quick to the ball, which I think would make great TV. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think think Cav would be would be great for this this series. But I mean, I, I, at the moment, it doesn't look like he's going to ride the tour. They're they're, they're saying. Oh, is it not? I thought I thought that I thought that was pretty much going to be a thing that happened. No, no. I mean, they're, they're talking about Jakobsen, Fabio Jakobsen, riding the tour for for quick set. I mean, obviously. The, he wasn't supposed to ride the tour last year, and he did, and and did so well. So, I mean, I'm not going to say he isn't going to ride, but that, that that appears to be not the plan for for Quick Step at the moment. I mean, I think maybe Netflix can start a team and take him. Yeah. I think the the other the other personality I I'm, I like to see more of is is Ala Philippe. I mean, obviously not great for an English speaking audience. His English isn't fantastic, but for 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 a French audience. I mean, he's just such a such a live wire. I mean, he's just so so entertaining. And I think behind the scenes, you just you just be like that as well. Let's end this week's podcast on very much a sad note, and it's news that shocked me when I saw it. It was an absolute double take, um, and that is by marking the loss of Richard Moore, the author and podcaster who passed away suddenly last week. 
Moore was the author of Slaying the Badger, which is a fabulous book, and In Search of Robert Miller, amongst other titles, and was familiar to many cycling fans as the founder and driving force of the cycling podcast. And Pete, you knew him well. Yeah, I was, uh, I mean, like like you, Ojo, I was just completely shocked and, and devastated when I first heard the news on, on Tuesday morning, I think it was. Um, I'd seen Richard at uh, a couple of stages of Paris Nice just three weeks ago, spent an hour chatting with him prior to, prior to one of the stages, which is always, I mean, I always enjoyed it. I always enjoyed seeing Richard. And I think that was the thing that everybody, everybody in the press room enjoyed seeing Richard. He had uh, just a really engaging personality. He knew the sport really well. He was just such a, such a friendly guy. And, um, I mean, I, I I first came into contact with him. I think I was trying to think about this probably the best part of twenty five years ago now, when I was working on Cycling Weekly, and he was he was actually racing as a um, trying to make it as a. I don't think he ever turned pro, but he certainly rode um, big events in the UK as represented Scotland. He represented Scotland at the Commonwealth Games in nineteen ninety eight. And uh, he contacted one of the journalists there, Kenny Pride, one of my colleagues, who is um, also Scottish. And Richard became like a, an occasional freelancer for us. And you could see very, very quickly that he had a lot of writing talent. And uh, I mean, I came, came to know him better when after he'd written um, his book on Robert Miller, which, uh, which won an award for, for uh, Biography of the Year. And I was lucky enough to spend a, a tour traveling with him in the car. And that's, uh, I've seen other people giving, giving their, their memories of, of being in the car with Richard. And it's just, I mean, I, I, can, I can think about it now and if him kind of hogging the, the CD player all the time and putting Band of Horses on and uh, the Fleet Foxes and all kinds of stuff, which, which I listen to now. And I always just associate with Richard and I'll, I'll never forget that. And uh, Bell and Sebastian as well, which I wasn't quite as taken with, but um, it was it was just a, a real joy to be with him. You kind of have a, have a nice meal in the evening, a drink and a chat. And he's just such a laconic figure. He had this kind of beautiful Scottish brogue, kind of Sean Connery like. And uh, I mean, I, as I said, I'm just kind of devastated to hear at, at the age of forty eight that uh, he's gone so soon. You know, you you bond on the road. You know, you see the best and worst of people. You see people frayed, uh, sleepless, and you know. And he was part of the group. You know, that their familiar faces, finish lines, and familiar faces in the kind of service stations when you stopped and got your coffee on the way to the finish. And it's it's a weird thing, but you become this kind of, you do become a, a you know like a travelling band. And um, he was a, he was a key member in that band, and he's gone. And I think people yeah. people really miss him. I think yeah. The first the first cycling job I ever did when I was moving from being a, a presenter to trying to do some journalistic stuff in cycling, I was sent off to the Team Sky training camp for the BBC, and there was some a couple of terse comments about why a presenter was doing a journalist job from some people, but Richard wasn't one of those people. He was friendly to me from the start, absolutely from the start. He really, really was, and. Um, I remember going for a bike ride with him at a following Team Sky training camp a couple of years later, and we sort of sat up, went all the way to the lighthouse, and he was just wonderful. And it is the news that when I saw it, it w- it was a please no, and it you know the sad news. But uh, we thought we'd end this podcast by marking the passing of Richard Moore. And that's just about it. The 2022 Ronde has been and gone. Pogaccia has muffed his lines and the profile of women's racing goes from strength to strength. We'll be back for the Amstel Gold Race of the Ardennes Classics Beckon. Also looking ahead to the Queen of the Classics, that is the Cobbles of Paris-Roubaix. Thank you to Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, OJ. And thank you to Jeremy as well. Nice ship, by the way, Jeremy. Lovely yacht behind you. Anyway, thank you for listening. I've been OJ Borge and shall carry on being OJ Borge for as long as I can. This has been a Big Ring production for Peloton magazine. Peloton is an award-winning print and digital magazine available worldwide. Known for quality, design, long-form storytelling and historical features. In the past 11 years, Peloton has become the go-to cycling magazine for serious cycling fans and enthusiasts around the globe. Please visit pelotonmagazine.com to learn more about our membership options. And it also smells great when you open it. Give it a sniff. Smells wonderful.